Well, good morning. It is great to see. I can tell who worked last night at the, at the fall festival because they're like. <laughs> and I almost ran into the children if that tells you where I'm at. So, But I'm glad to see you guys this morning. Today we're going to talk about prayer and worry. So let me ask you a question before I start. And that would be, do you want to be happy? You know, Jesus' first sermon, the Be- we call it the Beatitudes, was, a- was about, it says blessed are, but it means happy are. You know, Jesus said, happy are you if you do these things. So, so the question is, are you happy? And then the second question is, how would you define happiness? And so I want to talk today about this idea of worry, but I, but I want to tell you, so I was trying to think, when do I worry? And it's multiple times, but... Um, This happened recently, and it was almost funny, uh, to the point that my sweet wife gave me a pep talk. Have you ever had that much worry that somebody... So there was a meeting I had to go to, and I was in charge of something, and there was one person at this meeting who literally complains every meeting. Not every other meeting, not every third... Every meeting. And this time, I was in charge of the event, and so... It was going to be me. And so I said to her, I said, if I don't go, what do you think happens if I just don't go? Because I don't want to deal with that person. I just don't want to go. And she said, well, do you think you're not supposed to go? Which is never a good question for a pastor because, of course, I know I'm supposed to go, but I don't want to go. You ever not want to go? I mean, sometimes if you're a teacher, you wake up in the morning. I know your little pep talk to yourself like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And, and we tend to think. Now, here's what's funny. The rest of the people at that meeting, I love. I care about all of them. I think they're awesome. But all I could think about was this one person. And then, then I don't know if you do this, I was trying to anticipate the questions they might ask and got myself more stressed out because then I wanted to try to figure out how to answer all the... Does anybody else do this? Is this just me? Okay, I feel better. Okay, thank you. So, so you know... So I, finally, I go to the meeting. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go. And I told Kristen, I'm going to go. She said, I'll pray for you while you're... She's so sweet. And I'm just like, why don't you just yell at me to get out, there, get out of here? Anyway, so, um, so I, I go to the meeting. I'm driving there. Of course, I'm doing the same thing. I'm processing all the questions I might get, trying to figure out how would I answer this one and how would I answer that one and what would I do with this one and what... You know. And so I get to the meeting and we start the meeting and I'm looking around. He's not there. He, and it wasn't you, Paul. He's not... <laughs> Billy, it wasn't you either. Uh, so, no, but, but he's not there at the meeting. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you know, I got freaked out, worked up, all freaked out. Now, here's what's amazing. I found out something at this meeting that I went to. At the end, somebody said something that... Not about that person, by the way. But it was something that helped me, and it will help me for years. It was just a little thing that I needed to... And I'm like... Wow, thanks for sharing that. I really need, I needed to know that. Um, And so here's what I know about life. Sometimes, not every time I don't think, but I think sometimes when you're the most fearful to the point that you're almost paralyzed, it's because you are doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And because of that, you will have more opposition sometimes. And I believe sometimes from the enemy, sometimes it's from yourself. Let's just be honest. I don't need help. I sometimes am very good at just paralyzing myself. But, but there's a push to not follow through on the most important things. So when you find yourself worried, recognize that that worry may be because of the level of importance of what you need to do or what you need to deal with. Now, sometimes we worry over silliness, right? I mean, just like the skit guys were talking about the manna in the desert, you know, where they would get a daily supply and if they collected too much, (laughs) it was disgusting. They basically had to wait every day. God did that on purpose. And that's why when Jesus teaches us a prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. I wish it was weekly, monthly, retirement bread, you know. And many of us, what we're worried about is retirement bread. And we're worried about, as we get older, right? 
If you're under 50, you're like, what's he talking about? If you're over 50, you're like, I got it. If you're retired already, you're like, I've been there. And so we sometimes pray, Lord, give us this day our lifetime bread. And he says daily bread. And so deal with what's in front of you. So let me, let me give you a couple things. We're going to talk about how to, wor- to move from worry to faith. And I hope I'm going to give you three tips, three things from Scripture that you can do. And we're looking in two different chapters of Luke. And we're pretty much going to be doing two chapters at a time, mostly from now to the end. But once again, I encourage you, like I do every week, go ahead and read the chapters. I can't talk about every verse of every chapter every week. Um, but... I hope that it inspires you enough, gives you a taste uh, uh, of Scripture enough that you want to read the rest. So, so remember I asked you, do you want to be happy? Let me ask you a second question. Do you want to have peace? When you're worrying, it's like the opposite of peace, right? Are you fun to be around when you're worried about something? <laughs> that was funny. You guys like groaned. That was audible. Uh, you didn't know you did, but you went, oh, oh. So what does it look like? And how can you move from this position of worry to walking in faith? And by the way, when you walk in faith, you're able to love people better. You're able to encourage people. When you're worried and and fearful, what do you do? You go into panic mode. So what do you do? You look inward. You look inward. Somebody said to me, you know, we've got uh, voting happening and all this stuff and people are all freaking out. Why? Because they're fearful. Why? Because politicians want you to be fearful. They're telling you that if the other side wins, you're all going to die. Can I guarantee you something? No matter who wins in a few weeks. Is it a few weeks? Two weeks? Whoever wins in a few weeks, can I tell you a secret? Jesus is still in charge. Amen. And so if you need to learn a lesson by, from whoever wins, okay. And if you need to go undergo persecution from whoever wins, okay. I mean, I, I don't like that. That's like saying, do you want a hot bath or a cold bath? Uh, I like warm. I don't know. But some people tell me cold baths are good for me. But that doesn't mean I want one, right? And so, so as you walk through life, you can choose to worry or you can say, you know what, God, you got this, regardless of the next step. Now, you might be dealing with something with your family right now. You might be dealing with something like a friend right now. You might have that person like I have that I'm thinking, I'm not looking forward to seeing that person. Do you ever have that? Do you, any of you? That person's a little tough to deal with. And I'm not talking about you, Paul. So, but, um, right? And so, so we all have those people in our lives. Are you going to worry about it or are you going to deal with it? Okay? And so how do I walk in faith through this? So number one, pray expectantly. Pray expectantly. What is expectation? It's saying, God, I know you can do this. God, I know you can take care of it. You expect God to do what only he can do. And so are you praying that way? God, I'm expecting you to do what only you can do. So let's read what happens here in Luke chapter 11. We're going to go 1 through 4, and then I'll skip up to 8. And lots of reasons for doing that. All right. One day, Jesus was play- praying in a certain place. I'm going to come back to that, so put that on your thought shelf. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord... Teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So what's the formula? Jesus says this. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Time out. Most of you who've memorized the Lord's Prayer are like, Eric, you're missing parts. And that's on purpose. Jesus did not teach them, pray this formula, pray this specific way, pray these sentences. Why? Because when you pray the same sentence over and over, just like if you're not careful, when you sing the same song over and over, guess what happens? You didn't even pay attention. One glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Can't you tell how excited I am about that? (sighs) To a home where joy will never end. Right? And the same thing, if you prayed the same prayer over and over, listen, there's nothing wrong with saying the same prayer. There's nothing wrong with singing the same song. But pay attention to what you're saying and what you're doing. The reason Jesus doesn't say just pray exactly this way is why. He's teaching them a pattern of prayer. 
And it starts with, you're holy, you're awesome, you're unbelievable. It's, it's hallowed your name. God, you're, you're above anything. God, you're more powerful than me. Why? Because have you felt, figured out that you're not powerful yet? Have, have you figured out what you are and are not in control of? You, you think you're in control, right? Until you go to the doctor and then you find out. What? But I've taken care of myself. How could I have, you know, fill in the blank, right? And we all have friends like that. Like they never smoked. How did they get lung cancer, right? Or whatever, right? Fill in the blank. And we all have those times. So what do we do? Hallowed be your name. God, you're, you're more powerful than I'll ever be. You're in charge. And Lord, you know what? You know the length of my days already. You know where I'm headed. And Lord, no matter what, at the end, when I say, what does this button do? The next day, the next moment, I will say, oh, hi, Jesus. What are you doing? Oh, no. Right? And that's, that's the worst and the best day of your life. And so when you realize he's in charge, you go, God, you know what? You're in charge. Verse 8 uh, uh, finishes this story where it talks about basically somebody begging this guy to open the door and let him in. And it says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. And I don't know why Shirley's involved in this story, but there she is, right? Right? He will get up and give you what you need. Why? Because you continue to ask. Why? You're persistent. You are expectant. You expect God to do something. And so I'll be honest with you. Sometimes what I pray is, God, this is what I want you to do. And if you want to do what I want you to do, that would be great. But your will be done. You know, that's what Jesus prayed in the garden, right? God, take this cup from me, but not my will, your will. You know what I need, and you're going to take care of me in what I need. But what if what I need I don't like? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And so pray expectantly. I remember uh, Christmas time's coming, and people don't know this, but November 1st hits and the pastor changes lives. Every year. If you haven't seen the memes about the, the Carlton dance on November 1st, that's me. That's, that's where I go. Plus, number two is I'm going off my low-carb diet for two months. So I'm really excited about November. So anyway, so, but here's the thing. So, so when I get bigger and bigger, just, just nod and smile and say, Pastor, you look happy. Um, <laughs> but, but when I was a little kid about this time of year, remember the Sears catalog with the toys would come in the mail? Years ago, we had this paper thing that had pictures in it. It was almost like Instagram. And it said Sears on the top. And in there was all the toys. And my mom, because she had five kids, so she couldn't remember what we wanted. So she'd give us a highlighter. And we got to open it. And I was a little bitty kid, I hope, because this story would be weird if I wasn't. But I, but I opened it, and in there was a Tonka truck with a little driver and a, a dump truck, and that's what I wanted. And my mom said that I would come home after school, and every day I would open to that page, and she'd find me in front of the TV just looking at it. And she said, we just had to get that for you. And that's the way we should be with prayer. God, you know what I want. And here's what I think will happen, and many times I pray, Lord, if it's not what you want for me, would you change my desires? And I will tell you, there's been times in life that I was going towards something, and I said, this, God, this is what I want, God, this is what I want, God, this is what I want, and the whole time I prayed, but your will be done, and guess what happened? He changed what I wanted, and even, there was one opportunity in my life where I was offered what I had always wanted, and I said, no, I don't feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. And the reason I'm your pastor today is because I said no to a cruise line that wanted me to be the drummer on the cruise line, and I said yes to intern at a church. But I had always wanted to be a drummer. I had always wanted to pursue that. I had always gone that way, and God changed my desires, and I didn't want to do that at all. And that's what God can do for you. Read God's Word and discover His power. If you're struggling with worry, read about who God is. 
Remember, Jesus was in a certain place praying. Why? Because sometimes, in order to get quiet, you got to get out of your routine. When's the last time you took a walk? When's the last time you went and sat by the water and just realized how awesome God is? How awesome everything around you is so amazing. And you say, God, you put all that together. It's beyond comprehension. And you worry less, what, when you read about who God is and how much he loves you and how much he cared about you and how he puts things together. Number two, pray persistently. That's just fun to say, especially if you're missing front teeth. I have never been as persistent in my life as when I got my first Atari. Atari was the first Xbox. So I got my first Atari. And David, maybe you'll remember this one. And I got Missile Command. And I was terrible at it at first. All they had was a stick and a button. There weren't 42 things. That's why we're really good with thumbs and fingers. So I got Missile Command. And I'll never forget, I'm getting better and better. And then I notice the sun coming up. And I went, oh no, I have played Missile Command all night long. All night, all night. It was unbelievable. I, I don't think I'd ever done, I, I never could stay up. I stayed up, all, didn't even know I stayed up. Why? Because I was addicted. When we pray, let's be persistent like a kid learning a video game. Like a teenager on their new crush, right? So here's what Jesus says in verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Ask, seek, knock. Those are all things where you pursue, 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 right? For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. To the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, I talked to the kids about this. Fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead. Only the worst parents, right? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. That is a terrible thing. If you then, I love this, if you then, though you are evil. I'm like, is that what you think of my parenting skills, Jesus? Right? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Maybe I should put grandchildren in there for some of you, right? How much more will your Father in heaven give? Listen, what does he give you? Everything you need, everything you want? No, the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Why? Because what does the Holy Spirit do? Jesus said the Holy Spirit would remind us of everything that Jesus told us. He would convict us of sin. So show us what's wrong, where we made mistakes, when we need to say to our spouse, I'm really sorry about that, right? But also convict us of righteousness, which means doing what's right. And so he gives you the Holy Spirit. Why? So you know which direction to go. So you know you're supposed to go to that meeting even though that person might be there. Right? So so you know what you're supposed to walk in when it comes to life. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to keep hoping and asking while waiting. And let me tell you what it looks about. When Kyle's like 31 now, my, my oldest. Oh, man, that made me feel old. But when he was about eight, he came to me. He said, Dad, can I have the car keys? I'm like, uh, why? Because I want to learn to drive. <laughs> no. You got a few more years for that. God's the same way with us. So there's times that God says to us, uh, you're not ready for that. You're not ready for that. And sometimes we have to take that waiting answer as a no for the time. And no, God knows what's good. And you know what? Once again, he'll change our hearts to the direction he wants to go. If we're sensitive to him, if we're paying attention to him, if we're obedient to him, we just listen to what he said. And then we do what he's called us to do. Do what he's called you to do. Number, oh, here's a great quote. God doesn't want us to be consumed with worry and anxiety. Instead, he wants us to turn our worries over to him and trust him with the future. Number three. Refocus on God's provision. So they've done studies that your brain cannot think of nothing. Although some people think they try and they 
claim that they reach a level of. But it, the more ADD you are, the worse this is. But if I say to you, do not think of a purple cow. Yeah, many of you, not all of you, but not all, because some of you fell asleep during the sermon, and that's okay. But some of you thought of a purple cow. You, you thought of what? So, so here's the thing. When worries flooding your mind... Make a conscious decision, especially when you find yourself not breathing. You ever worry so much that you realize your, your watch says, why are you breathing so fast, right? <laughs> or your spouse, <laughs> right? So what do you do? Refocus on what God has done for you. So listen to what it says next. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not worry. And the word here for worry means distraction. Any of you ever feel distracted? Any of you not notice I asked that question? Okay. About your life, what you will eat, about your body, what you'll wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. What's he do? Jesus says, back up, quit just looking at yourself, just quit looking inside, don't just pay attention to what you need, but look around. Remember, Jesus went somewhere else to pray. He got away from normal to go outside of where he normally was to pray. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour of your life? And by the way, we know the opposite's true now, don't we? You want to shorten your life? Keep worrying. You want more gray hair? Keep worrying. Since you can't do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the wild flower, how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these flowers, little bitty flowers. Rodney, who was a pastor here years ago, um, talked about he loved it when the little white flowers popped up in the front of our building. Little white, they're weeds. I said, they're weeds. He said, yeah, but they're cool looking weeds. I had some weeds pop up in my garden, and I was getting ready to pull them, and then I realized the bees love those weeds, so I've left the weeds in my garden. There's certain weeds I've left in my garden, because I'm like, the bees love those. I'm going to let the bees have them. I wish the deer loved them, but they don't, so, right? And, and I'm like, wow, it just blows me away. Something to me that's kind of ugly, God uses. That's <laughs> in the mirror, too, but okay. For the pagan world, excuse me, and do not set your heart on what you'll eat or drink. Do not worry about it. Why? For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom. You're turning your mind. And these things will be given to you as well. And then I love this verse. You may have never heard this one. The next verse in the series is, Do not be afraid, little flock. He calls us little flock. Don't you love that? For your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. God's excited to have you as part of his family. He's not disappointed. He's not begrudging. So here's your final encouragement. Recognize God's power and blessing. For me this morning, that meant that when I had my quiet time, I sat on my back porch and watched the sun come up. And spent some time in prayer and thanksgiving. To re refocus. For George Mueller, who started the very first orphanage ever, and the reason we have orphanages is because of a Christian guy in Europe that had an orphanage. And he had all these young men in his orphanage. And one morning, they didn't have food or anything to drink. And so, and so it came time for breakfast, and all the boys are sitting there looking at him. He goes, okay, we're going to pray a blessing. Lord, we don't have milk, and we don't have bread. Could you provide for us? He said it wasn't five minutes later that all of a sudden a knock came at the door and the bread maker was standing there and said, I've been up all night. I couldn't quit thinking of y'all, so I made some bread last night. Next thing you know, the milk cart is out front. The milkman knocks on the door, says, my cart broke down right in front of your orphanage and this milk's all going to go bad. Would you take it? And they took all the milk. I've always thought that milk guy probably had a dream too and said, I ain't doing that. Anyway. And God provided. 
What do you need God to do in your life? Who are you praying for? Who are you worried about? What's frustrating you? What are you carrying around that you can't do anything about anyway? Maybe it's time to say, God, you know what? I release this to you. Maybe it's time just to go outside and say, God, you know what? You created the rainbow. You created the fog. You created these beautiful trees. You can exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen right in front of my eyes. And Lord, I trust you to take care of me. And your worry will slip away. And you begin to give thanks for all the blessings. By the way, little secret. You're here today because you made it past the last worry. And a lot of your worries won't even come true anyway. The guy doesn't show up for the meeting. So quit worrying so much about it. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love you to do that today. I'll be here after the service. And you can say, I want to give my life to Christ. I know about him. I understood him. I went to church a lot, but I've never surrendered my life to him. Maybe you want to do that today. Or if you're here today and you're struggling with worry, can I tell you a secret? Hand it over to him. You can do that even now. Let's close in prayer. Join me. Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you are our Father that is in heaven, not just a distant deity, not somebody who's looking down on us, but somebody who says they've chosen gladly to give us your kingdom. Thank you for that, Lord. We don't deserve it. We know we don't deserve it, but thank you that you're glad to do that. Father, help us to walk in that faith, knowing that you love us and care about us as a loving, heavenly Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.